Hey friends, Victor Pisano here with Charge Up. As part of our Building the Champions Mindset series, I want to welcome a friend of mine whose name may sound familiar because he was also a part of a panel discussion we had back in uh, early March. I want to introduce you back to uh, Dr. Michael Goddard. I wanted to bring uh, him back for his, there he is, you got your little high out there. So I wanted to bring him back because his enthusiasm and passion are, are unparalleled. He's one of those unique individuals that, when I, when I think about those who are involved in our community, especially in education, he embraces what I call that calling to serve. And it's absolutely obvious in every single thing that he does. He's a graduate of Stephen F. Austin State. He has a master's from North Texas State and even earned a doctoral degree in education from North Texas State. Served as FCA president, team captain, and was a four-year starter at Stephen F. Austin. He's invested over 30 years in working with our youth, and now he is the superintendent of schools with the Lovejoy Independent School District. He's one of the most involved, committed, and interactive superintendents that I've ever met. And if you don't believe me, I want you to follow him on social media, and you will have complete faith in our future leaders thanks to his dedication and spirit. And I'm going to include that information down below. So welcome, Michael. It's good to see you. Yeah, thanks. After that introduction, let's just close in prayer. That was <laughs> And good <laughs> right thank you for joining us yeah yeah that was good <laughs> <laughs> don't forget you owe me 20 bucks i kind of stepped right. it up a notch on that <laughs> so first question do you know what day of the week it is yeah you know that's interesting it's a it's a blurs day there you go that's yeah, what i was I thinking think too <laughs> yeah. you know this morning i handed my daughter something i was like can you do me a favor can you run an errand for me and go pick this up she was like yeah and she was five minutes walked back in and she goes you know today's not wednesday <laughs> yeah I don't even know anymore. It is one no of those things. Day of the week it is. I want to know. It's amazing how fast it, it still goes fast. The days go quickly, but it's so strange. I don't. It's still April. I, who told me that it's uh, it's a crazy leap year? Yeah, because there's 300 days in April this year. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's five years in May. I know. I get it. Totally. <laughs> it has been done. So I want to jump into this thing because I want people to learn uh, where it comes from with you. And I can't wait to hear some of these answers. But so you've had 30 years invested in making an impact with our youth. Uh, obviously, numerous accolades along the way. And you've, you climbed that ladder. I mean, that career ladder was every step of the way, uh, earning the respect and empathy uh, of those around you because of your involvement and the way you approached your career. So here's the difficult question. 30 years, sum it up in one word for me. Influence. Yeah. I don't know what that means to you. I'd say that I had a lot of influence in my own personal life and those who invested in me, whether it was coaches or teammates or uh, even those who uh, tried to bring me down at times, uh, really fed my fire to be an influencer for others. Um, and I think that's been kind of the driving force for me, just no matter what my title was or occupation was at the time, is that I wanted to be a positive influence on people or around me um, because I had people do that for me growing up. And is that something that um, you strive others in your circle to embrace? Yeah, and I think as I've even uh, got a little bit older and recognized that my job is to teach the influencers to influence even more. So yeah. recognizing that a leader isn't someone with a title or a position. A leader is someone who's got someone to their left or to their right who that they can have an impact on. Um, it's uh, whether it's through something like what you do in a podcast. I've seen you firsthand and I follow you a lot and I see but you have an influence and an impact on more people than you even know or recognize, but you have a certain set of people that I'll never meet in my life. Um, and so if, you know, you and I are connected. So my greatest joy would come is if I can help impact you and help you to influence more and more. And so I try to do that for our kids and for our, our staff, our teachers, parents, and even my own family. And just so people know, uh, Mike and I met uh, back in November uh, yeah. at John Gordon training course for the power of positive leaders. And it, it was a phenomenal experience just learning firsthand from John as well as Julie. Yeah. Uh, but 
I guess UI and Chip Baker, who's also been a part of the program, we just kind of clicked pretty quickly and had our own off conversations during the breaks. And it's amazing because both of us, uh, John Maxwell certification, John Gordon certification, and just to have conversations that inspire, and I know what he's referring to, or I know a particular lesson that he's talking about, or one of the laws that he's speaking to. Yeah, it's it's really cool, and you know, it's only been six months, and I'm so happy that uh, you, I, and Chip have been able to hang on to that relationship and build it. Um, so when you talk about influence, I think all three of us had this ability to influence each other yeah. uh, to make sure we stick together, and and that's what's been fun. Is I know I can rely upon you for a question. I know I can rely upon Chip, and you know. We all hope it works all three ways. Yeah, I think one of the greatest things, that's a great example, and I couldn't agree with you more, is that you want to surround yourself not with a large circle. Like I could have tons of followers on social media and we might be connected, but we're maybe not influenced by it. So it doesn't mean you can't influence those around it. But one of the things, if your circle, if you've got two or three or four in your circle, it becomes an accelerant for your uh, igniting your fire within. And that's the piece I think is so valuable. If you can find that in people and surround yourself with that, you, you are a very fortunate person. Well, you know, my, my dad used to always say, whenever you have a problem, that's why you have one hand. Yeah. And when a, a, an Italian man says that, you wonder exactly what he means. But, you know, as he got older, you finally have to admit you have no clue what he means. And you're like, Dad, what did you mean by you have one hand? And he was like, I can count my best friends on one hand. I can count the people that I can trust who will always be there, who will never say no. More importantly, who will be completely honest with me and will guide me in the right direction. They see my blind spot better than I see. And I was like, I finally understood when you've got a problem, that's why you've got one hand. Like, don't hold it in. Go to those people. That's amazing. Let them be a part of your solution. Let them be a part of the challenge you're going through. So that's a great point when you talk about influence. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, with with Lovejoy, part of what inspires me is seeing how involved you are with the community. I think more, more so how transparent you are in what's going on. Uh, your communication level with them is phenomenal. When you can see a post by a superintendent and literally see three or 400 comments of praise and thankfulness you've come across, you've made your point. So I have to ask you, how have you kept your staff, the administration, the teachers, and the students both involved and connected during this adverse situation? Yeah, I, I, you know, I I try to do that a lot in a normal situation, but now I think when we finally walk through this thing, nobody's going to say the person that was leading me uh, talk to me too much, or they connected with me too much, or I saw them too much. They're not going to say that. Now they may say, I never heard from them, or I, I didn't even know what was going on. Or so they may say that. So I think right now is a real test of uh, all leaders. I think in a time, whether it takes a pandemic or any kind of adverse situation, what's gets, when a leader gets squeezed, the core of who they are comes out and you cannot hide from it. Uh, and so I think this has been, a, you know, even this time of quarantine, it's been a lot of years of training of how do you find ways to pe- for people to stay connected in? So we, we've got the advantage of social media or put out YouTube or videos and those pieces. And we've been very purposeful in that. And so I've had more zoom calls with everybody. Like today I was with my security team. I was with my uh, pre-K teachers, my after school Academy folks yesterday or Friday. I was with my food service folks. So just getting a chance to connect with them. I didn't tell them anything, but take care of yourself, take care of your family and let me know what I can do for you. And that in and of itself, I got tons of different things connected. I also have learned a long time ago is I don't do that for the positive comments or the affirmations. Those are always nice. I mean, my love language is words of affirmation. So um, throw as much you want my, today, I don't mind at all. but uh, I think if you're in it to serve rather than to be served, that's the huge difference for that piece of it. And I think people see that come across just through my videos and all those other things. It's not, it's not for any other purpose than I hope it impacts and influences somebody's life and it makes them feel a little bit less isolated and connected in to what we're doing. And that's the beauty of, you know, calling to serve. And it takes a special, unique individual because 
a calling to serve isn't just in positive times. It's in adverse times as well. And it is something unique and special about a person who's willing to be that transparent, be that open, uh, to listen, uh, to take suggestions. And that's what I see a lot is you've got incredible communication resources just between your staff and each of the schools within the school district. It seems as if everybody is working together as one team. Well, even in your promo, you know, you asked me about uh, my favorite quote. And if you remember, I said, in the absence of communication, people create their own. Um, and I think it's really important for any leader, anyone, to make sure your story is told. Don't assume that somebody knows it. And that piece of it is uh, not so that you can be placed on the top of the pedestal. It's so that you can uh, find a connection point with people. Um, you know, something that's been hard for me is I have 50 of them right here. I wear a Disney pin every day. When I have a chance, you saw them. When it was, yep. Uh, and I wear those only as connection points and finding ways to connect with people because uh, everybody likes Disney, right? And the few that don't even tell me that, and that's our connecting point. But you know, when you can find something that resonates with people, I remember walking down the street downtown Austin, and a homeless uh, gentleman that I'd seen a couple of days uh, as I was walking by at a convention time, and he saw one of my Disney pins the first day and said, "Nice Disney pin." The next day, he goes, "Oh, that's my favorite character." Well, he and I sparked up a conversation for about 30 minutes. And I learned all about him coming from Houston and really what he was struggling with. And I gave him my Disney pen. He said, this is better than any food or any money you could have given me because somebody cared about me. And that's not affirmation for me. It's just showing you that there's connection points that you can have with people. Even now in times of isolation, I don't have to be able to walk down town, you know, downtown Austin right now or, or even my neighbor. But I will tell you this. I've seen more of my neighbors from six feet away than I ever have in my life because they're walking around. I had a chance to talk to him. I, and I met a, a, a lady across the street who's uh, been widowed for about a year. And finally, she's kind of come out. And now we help with her garbage cans on trash day. And all that. There's some silver lining for this whole thing. But I think that if we don't walk back uh, with some lessons learned during this time frame, we've missed the time and missed the reason for this and the purpose of it. Absolutely. I've called it a the pause button. It's really been the only pause button of my 50 years is where we actually can reset. Yeah. And we never have enough time in life to reset. Obviously, we make adjustments in our life, yeah. but to physically stop everything, I do hope that people have taken the time to uh, you know, be self-aware and discover their gifts. And you know, a lot of the athletes that I work with, I tell them, I want you to make a list of things you take for granted. And I don't care if it's the smallest little thing, like chocolate chip cookies, like write it down. Yeah, right. Because when you get to do each of those things on that list again, I want you to like actually acknowledge it and realize it because I've heard from so many of you how difficult practices are. And yet, you know, at the top of your list is God, I miss practice. That's like, right. I, I don't need, I, I give anything to run right now. Like yeah. I don't mind just to be with my teammates. Yeah. It's like, okay, like write that down. Because as soon as you start complaining in your mind and that negative mindset hits, remember there was a time I didn't get to do this. That's so true. So true. Yeah. So now we're going to go to the athlete. And based on your experience as an elite high school and college student athlete, that skill of balance, it seems to be an issue with a lot of athletes and kind of lending toward the building a champion's mindset. They have so many expectations and Obviously, they're setting goals. They're trying to manage their grades. You want them to be involved with the community and other things within school. What advice do you give your athletes when it comes to, to finding balance? Yeah, yeah, that's a phenomenal question. I, I would say that first and foremost, being an athlete isn't about the sport itself. Um, and what I mean by that is it's much more about the connectivity that you have, again, with not only your teammates, even if you play an individual sport, you're connected in in some way with those who train with you or those a team. Like my brother is a PGA golf trainer for Jordan Speed. Well, Jordan goes out and he is the performer, but Jordan has a team, right? So my brother's a part of his team. He's got swing coaches. He's got caddy. He's got, he still has his team of five or six that are still around him in an individual sport. But it's much more about that because even the Jordans of the world will give back to much more than whatever happens in golf. But it does the truth for us as an athlete uh, or even former athletes. The thing I would say that people, they always be like, what'd you learn the most from being an athlete? Well, I learned that I miss it. Like you talked about mm -hmm. when it's all done, you do miss it. 
but it taught me how to be a man, taught me how to be a better husband, taught me how to be a better dad, uh, because I learned all of these pieces that are life skills much more than still being able to throw a ball, right? I mean, I used to be able to run a 40 in about a four or five, four or six. I think I could ride it in two months now. <laughs> it's like, so that stuff goes away. <laughs> What doesn't go away is uh, the ability to rely on teammates or the ability to persevere or overcoming uh, a, a blitz in your life uh, that you may have faced. And I think that's the pieces that helps with the balance. If you see what you're in it, but this is teaching me much more than just the sport itself, because someday it will end. Uh, you know, we're watching the Michael Jordan last dance. Uh. Michael Jordan doesn't last one anymore. Uh, but what Michael Jordan does is talks about this. Those are the days, these glory days, but, who is he today and what's he doing now? And so I think that's the piece of it is seeing what you become beyond just the moment. So where did sports contribute to your success today as a leader? Yeah. Uh, so perfect example, we're in the middle of pandemic and guess what? In leadership 101, I don't know what manual you got, but there wasn't a chapter on how to handle a pandemic. No, unfortunately right? there, and there's not I, even an abridged version. I mean, the first two weeks of this whole thing, I'm looking, <laughs> through, like, what, what do you do? How do you shut down school? And do I mean, you're like, Come on. I think one of those things that helped me be resilient uh, and, and understand I could push myself further than what I anticipated. I could handle uh, uh, things on my own for sure, but it required me to build capacity in my teammates to carry the load with me. And so I think a lot of leaders far too often try to carry the entire load on their shoulders. And if you don't have dynamic teammates like I do, uh, and we build capacity each other, um, that piece of it uh, is it will come back to bite you if you if you're trying it's the same as when you're doing a team sport and you see that one individual who tries to do it all on their own i think we even saw it again talking about michael jordan michael jordan talked about in this last one it wasn't until he realized he couldn't do it all on his own even though he was scoring 80 points before when it wasn't until he realized he had to rely on his teammates they won this long string of going to championships and going we could do this for a while and so uh, i think that's such a powerful piece of it is realizing building capacity in your teammates around you and, you know, that I did find that so interesting. Here, I thought, I made an assumption that everybody embraced winner's version of the triangle offense. I thought, oh, yeah. obviously, because it just strengthened them. And then you hear Michael Jordan saying, no, nah, I was not a big fan of Texas offense. I did not want to do that. I didn't want, who, who did he not, he didn't want, uh, what's his name, shooting the ball. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, okay, like, that took some guts to say. But yeah. he's a competitor, and I, I understood where he was coming from. He's earned enough respect to make that comment. But isn't it crazy to see one of the most elite athletes in any sport have to come to terms with their own vulnerability and say, okay, you know what? It's best for the team. Let's do this. And even he said, like, I was blown away by some of his players I didn't realize. Yeah. And I think it was at that point where you realize, okay, some specials happening here now. Oh, it's yeah. going to change everything with basketball. And it did. Yep. And it really goes back to your champion's mindset. That's a champion's mindset is I want to build, I want to make my teammate be the best possible they can be. But I got to do that by setting the example of that I'm building capacity and everything I do. It. I don't know if you saw or heard this one point, and I can't remember which of the episodes it was in. I think it was this latest one when Jordan's trainer was talking about, I told him to do six reps and he'd do 12. Yeah. You know, and so it's stuff like that where that's the difference. And it, and it applies later on in life, even when you're not maybe lifting weights for competition. But it's uh, over-delivering on so many different levels uh, with people. And I think, you know, when you kind of go back to talking about connecting with people on social media, like when people least expect it, you're putting out a positive word. Or you're, you know, you're doing a video where you're being vulnerable because school just got canceled for the rest of the year, do those pieces. So it's doing the unexpected and above and beyond just like, Jordan talked about it and some of those other guys. It's focusing on the little things. Because think about it. He was training and wanting to build more mass. He plays 82 games in a season. Yeah. It was based on one opponent, the Detroit Pistons. He That's was tired true. of getting pushed around. He wanted to be stronger. Yeah. So he, he took the approach of, okay, I'm going to build some muscle mass. I'm going to keep my speed, and I'm going to continue working on my skills. But that's somebody who's got to focus in a champion's mindset. Is That was one opponent. He didn't prepare for Philadelphia or Cleveland or San Antonio. Like this was, we continued to be pushed around by one team. Yeah. And they spend an entire summer committed as a team while everybody else is traveling, doing their thing. 
all working out and getting stronger so they can push that mountain aside and move on to what's truly theirs. So absolutely that leader, because even Phil Jackson said, Michael said he was going to be in the workout room and they all followed. That's it. Absolutely. So we talked about leadership and we also talked about balance. You've got, this is so incredible. You have 4,650 students approximately within the Lovejoy Independent School District. This is a question that I guarantee you 4,650 parents want to know, how do you find balance in your life? Yeah, that took a little while. I'll be honest. It's, you know, I, I have a much better balance now than I would have before. And it's not even related to the quarantining. I think uh, I have had ups and downs and valleys in life that you have to learn that the hard way sometimes. And sometimes whether it's relationships that break up or those pieces that you learn what responsibilities you have in those pieces. I, I think that's if you keep repeating the same things over and over again in your life that don't bring the great things forward. Uh, and they keep playing the negative, uh, that's called insanity and it's old tapes. And you keep playing the same old tape and that eight track and it is the same bad quality that you're going to get. And if you don't upgrade and finding how you controlling what you control, um, it, it's so important. So I do think something as goofy is even when we're in normal situations, I have date nights on Wednesdays before church or choirs. Or, so I make sure some people think it's not romantic, but I make sure some of those priority things are in my schedule. Like I tell people, if you really want, if you want me to tell you what your priorities are really in life, let me just see two things, two things only. Let me see your schedule and let me see your bank account. And I'll be able to tell you exactly what's a priority to you. Um, and people are like, well, how can you tell that? Because I can tell you exactly what you spend money on and I can tell you where you spend your time. <laughs> That's an so, incredible perspective. Yeah. And that, most people would look at me and they're going to say, you right now you zoom too much and you have too much chick-fil-a those are high priorities in your life right now so it's good <laughs> but i do <laughs> i do think that's an important thing for us to really examine during this time even uh, i love your idea of the reset you know i was talking to somebody the other day and i even did a video about it is my phone got overloaded the other day i mean like first time ever it was like when things were really rolling and i had the circle of death you know you get that little thing that's rolling yeah. and my son's home fortunately from college and i was like brock what do i do he goes well you gotta do a hard reset I was like, like, do you throw it in the pool? What do you do? I mean, what do you do? So he taught me how to do a hard reset where, you know, you push several buttons and then rub your head and pat your belly, that kind of thing. But it, it did a hard reset. And all of those things that I had running at the same time, I had like 90 tabs open at the same time, which is what we do in life, right? We just have 90 tabs. We keep running faster and faster. I think it's going to get better. But I finally had a hard reset on my phone and it ran more efficient than it had in months. And I think about that for right now is this is a hard reset, just like you talked about for us, all of us doing a hard reset about what's most important and what have we been spinning our wheels over. And I even talk about that, you know, just about the bank account and your, your calendar. That's a, that's a good place to start going. What's really most important to me. I can do that own self exam for myself and, and determine what's most important. Yeah. And with technology, you can have that in about 10 seconds. You can just print them both and look at them. Yeah. Yeah, you may not want to do that because it's very indicting. So you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Plan a couple of weeks in advance before right, you yeah, go. Yeah. Have that circle of good friends around you that you talked about, your five, that you can rely on. <laughs> oh, man, I'm a punk. That one hand. <laughs> Call them in. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain, he says, the two most important days in a person's life are when they're born and when they find out why. So I got to ask you, when did you discover your why? And at that point, did you envision uh, the success that you would have in your community, uh, a, a very large community in Dallas. Did you envision that success when you discovered your why? Ooh, that's a, man, that's a great question. You ought to do a podcast or something, man. This is, you're pretty good at this. Fingers thing. crossed. That's what I'm, that's what my goal is. <laughs> One day soon. Uh, that's a, that's fun. Well, let me tell you, I think I discovered it pretty early that what I wanted to do. So it's that whole Simon Sinek thing of knowing what I wanted to do. I didn't really know how to do it, but I really hadn't become really crystal clear on my why until probably the, about 15, 20 years ago. And I'll tell you what happened. It was, uh, I was kind of spiraling. I, I, you know, NFL didn't work out, right? So that's, that's done. I thought I was going to go. Matter of fact, both my backups end up playing in the NFL for about seven, eight years apiece. So you're like, what happened? 
Now, I had seven concussions, so I couldn't remember what happened anyway, so it didn't matter. <laughs> so many guys was protecting me anyway. Uh, but, you know, at that point, and I worked at a, a resort and a Christian sports camp over the summer down in New Brunswick. And I will tell you then is when I realized, and I really, really like hanging out and influence the life of kids. T-Bar M? So, yeah, T-Bar M. I was down Both at t my kids. It's an yeah. incredible experience. So I got a chance to be the sports camp director, director there, and it was amazing. That's when the uh, Super Mike became uh, 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 an icon, I guess, of that piece of it. I won't tell you about those stories. That's I hope those tapes never come about. But that may be another edition of a podcast. Uh, all in of be, itself. It could be. Uh, and then I, I really was connected with someone in, in a relationship that uh, had different values and different connectivity than I did. And we started falling apart a bit. And so I went chasing the money and trying to make some more money and did not find the satisfaction that I wanted to at that time. And then uh, went and worked for the professional Christian athletes and was doing some things there and doing a lot of speaking while I was doing my graduate work. And I found again, I love being a chance to influence kids and being able to be there uh, really in their faith walk or, or even in their life walk to be able to help coach and and it wasn't until really uh, probably one of the more deeper valleys of my life uh, when that relationship ended and really at the point where I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do. I was talking at a high school all-star game, Texas, Oklahoma high school all-star game, found an old coach of mine that happened to be there listening. And he said, you ought to come help us start this new high school and be our speech teacher. And this is the end of July. And so I said, well, sure. I don't know why I said that, but a week later I walked into uh, an interview with the principal. Of, I happened to be in their wedding, the wedding of his cousin the week before we met. And he hires me on an emergency certification, and that was 20 years ago. Uh, and that, when I walked and stood in front of that classroom of those kids, 35, 40 of them, that was a lot of kids. I didn't know any better. They used the rookie and they used me on that one. <laughs> 35, 40 kids, instantly my heart ignited because I had found my why. And, you know, what I, what I, the reason I kind of tell that story, it is at that point, I really gave up and just really my prayer life was about, all right, whatever God you have for me next, just lead me to it. Like I never planned on being a superintendent 20 years later, but it's kind of, he's taking me different paths and taking that sphere of influence and growing it and growing it. But it wasn't until I really followed my passion around, around my why that I flourished. Um, and it took some ebbs and flows and figuring out. So I think a lot of those, uh, student athletes who graduate college or high school, they think I have it figured out right then. Yeah. And you don't, you absolutely don't. You're on a journey. And many times we see the picture right here in front of our face. We don't see the picture for what it can become and just take it day by day. You're only promised that day to day. And you, you may have goals, but that's the piece that I think is so important as you walk that deck is to be able to discover that why uh, it takes a little bit of a process. What's exciting about your journey is you literally took every step necessary within education to earn the respect and the empathy of your peers, because you can relate to everybody at every single level. And there's an appreciation for that, because I think some people at a certain point realize that they want to go into administration. So they may necessarily skip a step or go in a different path. And when I look at your resume, your path was I want to have experience in every aspect of education. It, it was almost as if you longed for that, is yeah. just to be a part of everything. And that that's incredibly respectful to earn the honor of being a superintendent. Yeah. And I think that's where so many people have trust in you is because you've been there and you've done that. And you're going to listen to them with empathy and with kindness and with understanding and you're probably going to make changes based off gut more so than somebody who just comes in from the outside. And that's, it's very bold, you know, for you to make that representation. Let me ask you something. What makes Lovejoy special? Yeah, well, we have a, such a unique thing, especially well, here's what makes it really special even to me is Lovejoy was a kinder through sixth grade school in a little red schoolhouse. Um, uh, all, and then kids after sixth grade went seventh through 12th grade to Allen High School, Allen schools. So I'm an Allen High School graduate. So most all my friends were that I was connected deeply with were Lovejoy, former Lovejoy students. So that's why I first started hearing about it. Um, and then I had a chance kind of through that journey I talked about before to go be the high school principal for the very first 
secondary program in Lovejoy history. So they decided uh, to, to vote to start a secondary program from scratch. They had, we had seventh uh, through ninth grade come back and start that there. So I had a chance to build the, uh, the high school at Lovejoy, start with that. I graduated that first graduating class in 2010. That's 176 graduates that are my own kids. Like right now, I say they are. Now, of course, they're all, you know, I, I went and got ordained so I could marry them and do all those other pieces. And uh, that now they're naming their kids after me, all this. I feel very old right now. And I tell them, <laughs> if you're having kids, that's a student code of conduct violation, I assure you. <laughs> so, Refer uh, to your manuals. Yeah, that's right. Please. So uh, that's why it's so special to me. I, you know, I left after that 2010 year to grow a little more in, in Prosper, Texas. And had amazing experiences over there. Oh my goodness. It was awesome. I loved it in Prosper, uh, but it was growing so fast. It was intense. Uh, and then I got a chance to go into Red Oak, which is South of Dallas and have a little different experience there. And I loved that time there. And then had an opportunity to come back home to Allen and love joy. And it's life is full circle. And it's amazing. When you start talking about discovering your why, sometimes the journey takes a little longer. Uh, but if you stay persistent, it's great things happen. I love you. You just said coming back home. Yeah. So it just, it just proves that connection that you've had no doubt. from yeah. your Allen days. Yeah. I talk a lot about turning obstacles into opportunities. And what I want to do is based off your experience, the wisdom, the observation that you've had, what are some of those obstacles that student athletes face at the high school level as they prepare for college? Well, my dogs like that question, obviously. I mean, Absolutely. Went, you have two. They, that. That was, they were cheering from the background. They love that. Hey, I will say this. The obstacles piece of it is, I, and you alluded to it a little bit earlier, is you forget in the moment or you don't know in the moment that the difficult things you're going through are, or, you know, many times an athlete wants to step in and they want to be the starter or they want to hit number four or they want to be the first seed or the – and that stuff just doesn't come like natural. Now, there may be some just absolute raw athletes, but you look at any great athlete. Look at, again, go back to this Jordan thing. You look at the, the you know, ups and downs. Look at Scottie Pippen. Scottie Pippen started out as an equipment manager his freshman year in college, right? And you don't ever know. And he's at 6'3". Then he also he's 6'9". And he grows and does it. I mean, that's the part of it is that far too often, I think, as athletes, we look at what's happening in the exact moment right then, and we just try to blanket uh, it over with everything's bad, but we don't see it as the complete journey of the athlete of creating a champion mindset. That's, that's the piece of it is, is uh, when you go talk about balance as well, it's not only building capacity in that time. You may have big goals of being all American by the time you're a senior, but what are you doing your freshman year to do that? Are you waiting to your senior year to do the things that you need to do? Or are you, what are you doing your in between your freshman, sophomore year in the summer? I mean, you know, that, that stuff doesn't just happen. All these guys that just got drafted, that's awesome. But here's what I remind them. 40% of the NFL is made up of those who didn't get drafted. Yep. So why, what, what's the difference? Opportunity. And those guys may be a little more hungry just because you got drafted a high draft choice. There's a few of them that certainly will make it and they have a better chance. But that doesn't mean you're guaranteed a spot on the team. You know, when I talk to college programs and specifically football, I will show three or four different clips from like a Sunday night or a Monday night game. And I absolutely love when they do the player introductions because 70% of them, you're like, where's that college? Where's that college? Because yeah. everybody expects they're all going to be from power five schools. They got to be. And then you yeah. start hearing some of these D twos and you're like D three and you, yeah. you start realizing like they started at Juco and then they went here and then, you know, are D two or smaller D ones. And you're like, it's all about the dream. I mean, that's oh, yeah. all it is. It's you as an individual and what you're willing to invest. It isn't your title. And part of title is where you went to school. So don't assume because you went there, it's yeah. just an automatic path. And I think athletes, they want to just buy the wall. They don't want to build it brick by brick by brick. And that's what it takes. And, you know, you are a perfect example of that is uh, I can imagine the hours and the frustrations and the failures that you had to endure brick by brick to build your wall to achieve the dream that you had set out for yourself. Wasn't failure the best thing in the world in hindsight? Oh, no. Hey, learning how to fail forward. You and I both know that piece mm -hmm. of it. You learn how to fail forward, you're going to be successful. Um, it's when you wallow in that failure, either become better or bitter. 
Uh, and if you're bitter because you didn't get a chance or that coach doesn't like me, you control the measures that you can control uh, versus those you don't. If you worry about those you don't, you're going to be distracted and miss out on the opportunities that you have ahead of you. You had a post, uh, I think it was last week, that uh, I, had, I had to watch three or four times because it was so inspiring. I'd love if you'd walk uh, those people viewing through it. It was the one where you were addressing your school district and it was called Walking Through Adversity. If you don't mind sharing that story, but more importantly, I love the two questions that you ask yourself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting. And you've been on, you're, man, you got a million uh, miles on your uh, frequent flyers. I saw that the other day. You're missing, you got a shout out like in two seconds from American Airlines. Two million. Is that what you Yeah. Got? I'm like 1.97. Thank God for COVID. Like, do you have like the bat phone of American Airlines? It was like they, they <laughs> back my name. I was amazed. But, you know, you've been on a flight. And here's one of the things I know it's frustrating for all of us. And, Many of our young uh, folks that maybe listen, maybe, maybe not experienced, but maybe your parents have, or you've been on a trip with a team and has, is when you get a flight delayed. Like you, I, I remember my wife and, and my son and I were uh, a couple of Christmas ago up at my in-laws and we were at Nashville airport and we were all set. And I don't ever get detail oriented until it becomes a Disney vacation or a family vacation. Like I can tell you down to the minute what we're going to eat, where, hot dogs are, where the Mickey Mouse ice cream is, the Dole Whips, all that. I can do all that. I, but in regular life, like, I don't even know what we're having for dinner, right? That kind of deal. So uh, we walk in, and we get all settled in, checked in. I had actually left my phone charger in the suitcase, you know, that whole thing. So uh, I remember we uh, saw the dreaded, you know, flipping of the time on our flight, and it was delayed for like an hour and a half. I'm like, oh, man. So I'm going to try to make the best of it. I'm ready to get home. I've been spending a week at the in-laws. I love them, but you know what I mean. Uh, and so, uh, we, we were ready to get back and we were eating dinner. So we come back and then I see the dreaded red letters of cancel come across and it was, it was panic. And I remember kind of having an out of body experience. I watched some people were yelling and screaming at the ladies behind the counter. Others were just running circles. And I just realized this is an uncertain time. We don't know what's going to happen, but all we know is I got to find a place to stay. And what are we going to do next? Right. And, uh, and so we called, we had a, uh, a hotel uh, pretty quickly right downtown Nashville. And I'll tell you, long story short is we had the best time as a family, like totally unplanned, totally uncertain times, but we had the most amazing time. Sure enough, I get a call, you know, uh, several hours later about the flight the next day. And we still talk about that now, even that that unplanned time was one of the richest time for us as a family. And I compare that a lot to right now what's happened. This was completely unplanned. Like none of us knew that we were going to have COVID-19 at the level we were or have the, you know, a pandemic or we were all loaded up on toilet paper way back when, right? Yes. So, yeah. So that piece of it is exactly kind of carrying over. So even as I start walking through each day and have these opportunities and they go fast and do Zoom meetings, I ask myself these two questions. Did I live well and did I lead well? See, I, I loved I love that point of it in reflection. Yeah. Did I live That's well it. and did I lead well? Yeah. And and you know what? In the assets, it, and you don't have to be in a position of, uh, uh, like we talked about, you don't have to have the title. You're leading somebody. If it's yourself, you're leading your family or you're leading yourself. Um, but then what did you do today to get better? How did you live well? Did you find joy? Did you laugh? Did you get to hang out with your buddies like I do right now? I mean, it's like, uh, you know, we may have physical distancing, but we doesn't mean we can't connect or share a text with somebody or let them know that they're loved. And so at the end of the day, did you lead well and did you live well? That's, I think those two questions, if each of us could just adapt that for a period of time and try to make it a habit, the fulfillment that comes as a result is probably so humbling just to yourself uh, yeah. because there might be a day where the answer is no. Yeah. And that's okay, right? right? It like, is okay. You accept that and you realize that you're human, although some people probably question if you are, but you realize you're yeah. human and that's a great thing. You're vulnerable and you're going to sometimes, you're going to fail to do something. Yeah. The great thing is if you have that opportunity to open your eyes the next morning, yeah. you got your gift right there. Like the, the day couldn't have started yeah. any better. Your no, eyes open right. to the light and you start and you run. You're, you, you've hit it on the head. I think what's so neat is that, you know, you and I both wear glasses. I use this as an analogy is that it, you, every morning I have a chance to put these guys on. It reminds me that I'm old, but the most important part of it is it reminds me to look at the lenses for, where in a different way. 
and that to choose to look for windows of the soul, which are every one of them, every one of us have those each and every day of like that one person that we maybe can connect out to or, or the person as we go out there, even though we may have a mask on at the grocery store, just encouraging that clerk behind there who's been yelled at a hundred times, but the one time that you're there, you're going to tell them, thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate you. Just finding those kind of opportunities is what really is a champion's mindset. I, I could not agree with you more. And so often people think that gratitude is a huge gesture and that it takes time to prepare. And I, I let them know it's that moment where you see something and you feel uncomfortable because you know you could do something yeah. like right then and there. Get comfortable yeah. being uncomfortable and do it. And we've yeah. all seen it. You know, you go to the grocery store and a lady's having trouble just putting a case of water into her car. That's the moment. That's it right there. It's so simple. You know, it's saying thank you and looking people in the eyes. Today, it's funny because it's almost a routine. Hey, how are you? Fine. Thank you. And I'll drive people nuts because they'll say, how are you? And I'm like, you know, I've had a pretty good day. I got to admit things are going good. Tell me about you. How's your day been? And they have no clue what to say Yeah, yeah. because <laughs> no one in their entire line for the past seven hour shift has asked them how they are. Right. They don't it's know like, if doing. you're kind enough to ask me how my day is, I want to know about yours. That's exactly right. I won't lie. It kind of drives my kids nuts sometimes. That's all right. I get the That's line. Right. I'm like, I don't care. I want to know. I might make a friend right here. I'm going to take That's a chance right. on this one. It's so fun. If you could hand out one trait to every senior, within the Lovejoy district that's graduating that they could carry with them for the rest of their lives, what would it be? Whew, that's a good one too. Oh, joy. Um, I would say that the reason I say joy is, first of all, for them to recognize they're on a journey that's full of opportunities and that they matter. And I, you know, I use that kind of acronym of journey, opportunity, and you matter. That, that J-O-Y means a ton when you can find that in your life and in that perspective that you face each day. You, you'll draw people to the light that you are when you find that joy. You know, not many of us, if you're walking into a room and people scatter, it usually means you're not bringing a lot of joy to the room, right? Or you stink, one of the two. But it's mostly about that joy. But if people are drawn to you, it doesn't mean you have joy have to smile and face I mean, there's days when it's challenging and people say, we always have beat. I mean, there are days where I am like beat down. Like last Friday, you know, when the governor, I knew it was happening when, when uh, the governor said schools canceled for the summer or for the rest of the, man, that stunk. I was, oh, it crushes me because I can't see my kids. I can't see our parents. I can't, I had to cancel baseball. So, and, but I did a gut check for two, you know, a couple hours and I was like, Okay, that's what it is. So what are we going to do now? How are we going to bring joy forward in this situation? What are we going to do? Whether it's writing notes to seniors or whether it's uh, making fine ways to have a virtual graduation by a drive through And we got all kinds of fun things, doing theme days every day for kids. And we're doing all kinds of goofy stuff to make it a different way and a, a memorable experience for all our kids. Uh, and I think our seniors in particular, and I've said this to many of them, you watch this. Uh, our seniors are going to walk out of this more resilient and more engaged in what's more important uh, in this life than any generation uh, over the last several generations uh, because of what they've had to go through in their lifetime. They're, they're, they were, they've been bookmarked between 9-11 and really even now, and they've seen this world that, that we're, you know, we've had a different ex uh, uh, experience with them. They're the most resilient group of generation that we'll ever see uh, in our lifetime because of the things that they're going through. Um, and uh, I think that's a strong, powerful characteristic that will build capacity and some great leaders. Some of the greatest inventions, some of the greatest discoveries, and some of the greatest companies were uh, invented and started because of adversity. And Absolutely. The only, yeah, the only way you can make coal, a diamond out of a coal is through pressure and adversity. And I think that there are a lot of diamonds uh, in waiting right now. I did a podcast uh, not too long ago and had a great discussion around the class of 2020 being that class of resilience and grit. Because even though there was a 99% chance that spring sports were not going to finish out, 
they were still all committed as a team. They still did the workouts as a team. They still did the Zoom calls as a team. They never lost hope. And they, I really think, grew stronger as a unit being apart than being together. And the lesson and the legacy they leave behind is that message of never take anything for granted because never have we faced a situation where somebody said, our season was canceled. And this generation has lost out on some of those celebratory events that marked an ending to one chapter prior to the beginning of another. And it is special that we, and I I see it all over social media, we honor them and remind them because I don't think they need to be told. I think in their heart they know, but remind them that we support them. We are proud of them. We are grateful for the sacrifice that they had to put because so many didn't want to really show that emotion. They felt that it, it was so small compared to those who were suffering. And by all means, everybody has compassion, but we also have compassion for others, not just those who are sick. And when these students were finally able to voice their just sadness over what was occurring and what was lost, the outpouring of support, it was one of those times where social media was an incredible uh, tool to use, but the outpouring of support from teachers, coaches, uh, you know, faculty, parents, friends, even strangers commenting on things. I thought it was such a beautiful salute to a class that will always be remembered. I mean, 2020 will always be remembered for that. There's no doubt. Yeah, and and on top of that, uh, I'm not sure the senior skip day that they pulled off can ever be uh, topped. (laughs) This was impressive. Yeah, you got to you got to give them a lot of credit. Yeah, total credit. I, hats off. You guys did good. I don't know how that that's impressive. So this is a difficult question, but I I, I want to throw this one out at you, and I feel bad Chip couldn't join us. But let's just say you're coaching, and you've got to make a decision: uh, start them, bench them, or trade them. Chip Baker, Victor Pisano, and one of the most elite athletes. Uh, only second to Jordan, I think, in pure athleticism, uh, you. <laughs> How do you handle that kind of a situation? And again, I feel bad Chip's so, not here. I really yeah, your question was going really well until that last part. That's pretty funny. Okay, so, okay, let me twist it a bit. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make Chip my defensive coordinator because the man is my aggressive. I mean, like, he's going to go get it. You know, he's a real – Go get go get it. Yeah, no doubt. Go get it, Right. You're my offensive coordinator, right? Because you charge up, like we're going to go out. You you talk about air raid times a thousand, like that's you. Going. That's right. Gunslinger. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to be the mascot, and that's basically (laughs) how I'm going to roll with that. And I'm going to just going to cheer you guys on on as much as I can because that that's you guys are legit and uh, uh, pretty amazing influencers in your own right. You did it politically correct and still made everybody feel great. See, that's what. (laughs) I almost want to go back to my senior year and go to Lovejoy just to be <laughs> around you. Hey, Michael, I cannot thank you enough for being a part of Charge Up today and sharing the wisdom and the knowledge you have. Uh, I, I do hope we can make a habit of this because I think once people are exposed to the passion you have and the excitement, they're going to want to learn and listen. But thank you so much for giving me the gift of your time. I know it's something that is the most valuable thing that you have. But I sincerely thank you. I hope you have a great day. I hope the class of 2020 leaves with a smile on their face, knowing that you'll continue to lead them as they move on into their life. But I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Appreciate you. Love you, buddy. Hey, take care of yourself. We'll see you. All right.